Hi guys, welcome to this tutorial on section A of your English language uh, exam paper, the categorising text paper that you'll do at the end of AS. And um, I'm going to focus today on section A of that, which you might commonly know as the grouping section, which is technically called categorising text. Right, quick overview of this, you've got one hour to do one question, 48 marks available, and you're sole job in this hour is to group some text together and analyse them. So put them into groups and when you've got them in a group, analyse them. On the screen now are a number of groups you could use. But I don't need to feel entirely limited to this. Some students also choose their own groupings. They might do things like use of humour or sarcasm or they might think of them in terms of uh, register. Um, they might group them together in terms of you know, the, the transcripts or, or the form. But these are, what I would say, a really comprehensive one, uh, list of challenging groupings that will really offer you the opportunity to get your high marks. Um, looking at a grouping like purpose or audience is a, is a really good way to get into that those top bands. Now, what you should be doing then, really, is using linguistic methods in order to explore those groups. So you've got a grouping like audience, and you're going to look at one or two, you know, two or three texts, and you then can look at the lexis. You could look at the pragmatics. You could look at the graphology to explore audience or to explore purpose. The analogy I often use is that your grouping is the cake and these little ingredients here will, will help you to create that. So try not to use these as groups in themselves, it's too limited. Use these as the tools in order to you know, uh, pick apart the grouping you've, you've created. I think one way to kind of look at this here on the screen is, you know, it's a simple process. Select two or three texts, think on a way you think about a way you can group them, link them together, and then use linguistic methods to analyze and to compare them. Right, my top tips for this section are that the most successful students will explore two, three, or four groupings and no more. Consider the fact that you have one hour. Within that time, you're going to need to read the texts, you're going to need to annotate them. And you're going to have to create some kind of a plan. You're going to have to work out how can I link them? How can I put them together? If you've got all of that plus your essay response, how on earth can you do more than four groupings? It's going to be impossible to achieve the level of depth and analytical and evaluative content that we're looking for. Again, the most successful students will look at two or three texts per group. And it's important to remember, it's fine to use different texts for different groups. It's also fine to use the same text more than once. So you could look at texts A, B and C for audience. You could also look at text A alongside D in terms of representation of speech. This section, you have got to show off your knowledge of linguistic methods, lexis, grammar, phonology and linguistic terminology. Lots of marks available for showing the examiner you understand that. Just on the screen here, you can pause it and read it you know, by yourselves. This is what successful candidates do. On the screen now, and again, pause it so you can have a scan over. This is what less successful students do. I think one of the most important things that I've seen on here is that less successful students list many groups, often with very limited discussion and development. So it's not a case of regurgitating every terminology, you know, every term, every linguistic method you've studied in the last year. It's about doing lots with what you know, lots of analysis. On the screen now, Please pause and have a look through at your assessment objectives. Important things to note, they're all marked equally. 
16 marks for AO1, AO2 and AO3. Other important things to remember that AO2, you're demonstrating critical understanding. That doesn't mean you're throwing in loads of quotes from, you know, English experts. What it means is that you're showing you understand how, th how language works. You understand the theory. It doesn't mean you need to put quotes in particularly. Here's a summary of the assessment objectives and what the examiners want to see. Pause this, have a look at it, make some notes. Okay, <clears throat> moving on. I think purpose is one of the best ways to start off an analysis or a grouping. Um, and one of the things that the examiners do say is to avoid broad purpose and focus on specific. You can see on the screen what I've, what I've identified as broad purposes. So this has been written to inform. This has been written to persuade. It's very GCSE. So what we're looking for is specific purposes. Imagine you've got a charity advert. Well, yes, it's to persuade, but I'm looking specifically. It's raising the brand awareness of that charity. It's creating public sympathy. It's helping to, um, you know, in the instance I've got here, if it was, a, I don't know, for uh, a homeless shelter, giving assistance and advice to people with addictions. Be specific. On the screen here is what I think you should be covering if you're talking about purpose. It looks about multi-purpose, context, linguistic methods. I'm not going to read this to you. Pause the screen and read it yourself. Other areas to consider. Audience. When you're considering this, think about who's the actual writer? But who is the implied writer? Who are we being made to think is writing and producing this text? Who is the implied reader? So who is the, the person they think they're writing to and who's the actual reader? Best example I can give is um, I received a leaflet from the BNP. Now the actual writer is someone within their publicity department. The implied writer was Nick Griffin writing personally to me. Now the implied reader was someone very concerned with immigrants taking over our country. But me, the actual reader, I don't support the BNP or anything they've got to tell me. So you can see that there's a real distinction there. Pause the screen here. These are the things to include when you're talking about audience. Right guys, the last thing I wanted to, us to, or just to share with you, is an example here of, um, just bear with me, it's an example here of uh, an exemplar response that the exam board have given to us. A student who's done you know, a superb full mark answer in their exam situation. Note here the fact that they go straight in, no introduction, no long-winded, lengthy, I'm going to talk about. My first grouping is of text D and E, as these texts are aimed at a very specific audience. Okay, see exactly what they've done. Two texts, audience. This is evident in the language used in each text. Text E, the opening of a children's book, is ideally suited to its audience of young boys. Children are made to identify with the characters as the graphology depicts them as pirates, something which many young boys aspire to be. This is reinforced with colloquial such as pang and ar, as these terms are both associated with pirates and merit some form of covert prestige among young schoolboys. As at a young school age, most boys consider the use of non-standard English to be cool. Another aspect which appeals to young boys would be the sustained use of alliteration throughout the passage, examples of which are rough and rascally, dangerous fun, and the rapscallion's return. Children would find this phonetically pleasing, and this would maintain interest, as would the didactic reference in, she made me take a bath. The child may associate the she with their mother due to the implied Directions to take a bath and eat healthy fools, foods, feel compelled to continue reading. Just want you to really reflect on this. This hits every single assessment objective. Terminology, analysis, great grouping. Okay guys, best of luck.